Hello everyone, Georgi here from DigiBurn, the world's first 100% self-help mobile app for burnout, burnout prevention, overcoming and prevention of relapse. Today we are back with another burnout triumphant episode where we have Darius as a guest. Hi Darius. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Nice to have you here. It's quite interesting how sometimes just the universe plays along. Darius is someone whom I was aware of and, and uh, grabbed my attention probably more than half a year ago in a completely different context. And all of a sudden, a couple of weeks or maybe a month ago, it turned out that nowadays, uh, first he has uh, switched his direction slightly, for, for which we are probably going to find out a bit later. And secondly, I got to find out that Darius actually went through, through a major burnout episode. Darius, to not really spoil it, why don't you introduce yourself? So my name is Darius Mora. I am a teacher and entrepreneur. And like you said, I went through a major burnout episode about a year and a half ago. As a result, my life has completely changed and I'm just grateful that I have the chance to share an insight or two or another aspect or another angle. Well, thank you for taking the time and uh, showing vulner vulnerability. It's always quite empowering to just enable others to gain awareness, to maybe have a realization moment or re a revelation, or at least a couple of tricks here and there. So what, what are you up to nowadays? Before we jump into the stories, uh, what are you doing nowadays? So a few months ago, I started a company called Vitality Therapeutics as a result of the burnout, actually. And we are dedicated to building a machine learning algorithm that can diagnose burnout, depression, bipolar, anxiety disorder, a bunch of other um, mental health issues. And um, we've just launched our very first product, actually, a couple of days ago, we were supporting an expedition to the South Pole, uh, which left 11 days ago, and they have reached the South Pole. And uh, they're using the Aura Ring to collect all of the physical biomarkers and our technology to collect all of the mental biomarkers. And then we're going to research with Berkeley University and uh, University College London to be able to fine tune the algorithm to diagnose depression and burnout and then commercialize the product and make it available for people, uh, for anyone to use it, hopefully in a couple of months. Sweet. For In, in my imagination, this somehow calls the, a comparison to a phoenix burning <laughs> down and then you know coming back in an even better form and shape. Well, I think we have yet to see how, how it all plays out. And as you know, burnout healing is a long journey. And this company is in a very early stage, so we'll see what happens. But uh, that's a beautiful way to look at it. Thank you. Got it. And probably it's a no-brainer, but still, I'd much rather prefer to hear it from, from your uh, standpoint of view. Why are you doing what you're doing? <laughs> During the burnout, shortly after, I had an epiphany. And I called it the micros and macros of life. And we can dive into that a bit later if you want. One of those insights in that epiphany was that I was no longer aligned with the mission of the company that I have helped start and grow. And we've just parted ways. And I realized that I need to leave that. That was one aspect. And another one is completely taking time off from work to heal and really emphasize healing. And a lot of study of, of burnout and what happens and um, kind of all things just came together and uh, it kind of became clear that this is what I need to do next. And I think it's actually a beautiful full circle story. So a few years ago, I've been talking to my father and my father has been diagnosed with bipolar 
So he's very familiar with the dips of depression and the highs of the um, mania or hysteria, if you will. And he was asking me about how AI works a few years ago. He was just interested. And so I was explaining about machine, machine learning and the patterns and all the basic, you know, the basic stuff. And, and then he was saying that, you know, you can break down song into a music sheet, some kind of a data, so that you can probably break down voice into some kind of voice data. And then his hypothesis was that, can you find patterns of, of healthy people versus depressed people, for example? Because if you go to a therapist, they'll listen to what you say, but mostly how you say it, right? Uh, the intonation and the ums and ahs we use and the volume. And there's about 70 biomarkers in the voice alone. And I thought it was an interesting idea. So I go online, I look at the latest research, some papers published in 2017 and 2019 about using machine learning to diagnose depression. One name kept standing out, uh, a researcher named Mashura Tasneem. And so I reach out to her and just have a chat to ask her about, you know, how the technology works. And it became clear to me that this was all done in academic setting and it wasn't perfect, but it seemed that it was soon ready for real life applications. And so when I left the previous company after the burnout and I was trying to figure out what to do next, I have reconnected with this researcher, Mashur Tasneem, and uh, I ended up uh, getting her on a team as the head of AI. And so she is now developing this technology and, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a cool full circle story. I love it. it uh, again, synchronicity and serendipity seem to be major themes there. Yeah. So maybe tell us a little bit more. It's, I guess it's also interesting for our audience. A bit more about the, um, about which part? About the expedition, about what you guys are doing right now with the vocal biomarkers, where are you headed to? Yeah. Like I said, there are, about se there are about 70 biomarkers within the voice. And the problem with standard diagnosing of depression, not even burnout, because that's even more difficult, but depression is that we use, or at least in the US, it is a self-assessment tool, kind of pencil paper questionnaire called PHQ-9 or GAT-7 that people will fill out and then they talk to a therapist that will give them a diagnosis. But there is no objective way to diagnose depression right now. There's not, we don't have a blood test or kind of, I don't know, saliva sample or something that you can objectively say and, and it's a binary of yes or no. And depression is more complicated. It's always a scale, it's dynamic, but unlike other physical health issues where we have objective measures. We don't have that with mental health. And our theory is that it's possible through voice. You know, if our mothers know whether or not we're feeling good or bad after five seconds of conversation on the phone, they can just hear it in the voice. And we don't think it's magic. We just think there are certain patterns in human voice unique to every individual, but still patterns that are kind of a gateway into our psyche. And this is not just kind of a, a hypothesis. We've, um, the studies have been done in a clinical environment, in an academic environment, and we're also working with researchers to make sure that we're not just kind of just shooting blanks. This is, we have an incredible um, team, like I said, Mashur Tasneem is the head of AI. Lauren Wright, our chief clinical officer, is also a superhuman, Lubo Kluczka, our CTO, is a fantastic engineer. So we have everybody in the team that we need to build this out. And um, we're excited to roll out a B2B version in the next couple of months where employees will be able to look at their own data. And a kind of a model I think of is Aura, you know, the Aura ring. The indiv There you go. So the individual person can see their mental health numbers and we'll have a vitality score just like our has an overall readiness score so we have an overall score for vitality and then several sub scores that you can see as an indiv individual and then the organization can see 
not the individual data, but how the organization as a whole is moving. So what's kind of, you can have a pulse on the company and uh, and see how people are are feeling because that's it's really hard to do otherwise. Lovely. And since we've departed a little from the burnout thematic and topic, but it's very interesting. Is there anything that at the moment you are in need of, or is there any way of anybody listening here to support your mission? We will be hiring a backend engineer soon. So if there's any backend engineers listening, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, any feedback on the product that we're putting out would be fantastic. And burnout, like you said, burnout is even more difficult than depression because we do have some of these tools like PHQ-9, GAT7, and therapists are well-known with depression. But burnout doesn't seem to to have its own kind of identification and and it, it's generally considered a subcategory of depression. It's, it's kind of a work-induced depression, but we think it's even more complicated than that. And so we're excited to also have a separate kind of diagnosis for, for burnout, for depression, everything else. And most importantly, we can give people signs and red flags earlier on in the process, not when it's too late. The issue with burnout and a lot of other mental health is that people only look for professional help once it's too late. People don't really begin asking for help early on. They only start asking for help once it's impacting their life negatively. And it's already too late by that point, right? Just like any you know physical disease, the earlier you start the treatment, the higher chance you have of recovery and easier it is and, and, and quicker it is and all those things. So we think that if we can give people signs and red flags and notifications, if you will, early on, and maybe pair them with the right people and, and give them a chance to have those conversations early on, then we can avoid a lot of the pain down the line. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing um, openly and also to the audience a little bit of a clarification. Typically, we jump straight into the story, but obviously here we have a slightly different case. So I hope you forgive us. We will now have a look at, at, at Darius' personal story, but it's definitely very exciting what you guys are doing and we'd love to uh, support you along the journey with whatever we can. Obviously, we are sharing uh, one common goal here, namely handling burnout in a more graceful way. Yeah, I appreciate so, it. Thank you. Sounds really, it's really exciting. Um, we'd love to, to support each other. So anyhow, let's, uh, let's maybe jump back to the personal side of things. The reason why we are now here. And uh, I wanted to ask you, could you maybe... Tell us a little bit about, about your personal burnout episode, um, how it happened, what happened when it started. Uh, you can start wherever you feel most, right? Yeah, so I'll start right in the middle on the day that I realized of burnout. And then I can tell you kind of the back story of the symptoms. And then I'm happy to share the after story of, of the healing journey. So... The day that I realized, I was, I remember so clearly, I was in Copenhagen and I was in my home office at the time in my apartment. It was a usual day, no big responsibilities, nothing huge that day, no stress really. I just, all I had to do really was to answer a couple of emails, just open my email, type yes and send, not even a big decision. Um, and then a bunch of other things, but very, very kind of calm day. And I sit down at my desk, I open my computer, and I can't get myself to respond to those emails. And I kind of just stared at the computer, sitting there, not doing anything for a while. And this went on for five minutes, for 10 minutes. And then maybe after like half an hour, I was thinking like, <laughs> What's going on? It felt like I was almost paralyzed where I knew what I had to do, but I couldn't get myself to do it. It was really, it was first strange and then it was very scary. And this was a tipping point for me. 
my body just had to completely shut down and turn everything off in order to force me to reevaluate the way I was living my life. And it is really now in hindsight, it really is a blessing. If I would have continued on the path and succeeded on the way that I was going, you know, in the 10 years, 20 years later, I would have been truly miserable. So in hindsight, it's a gift, but it's always difficult to see that way in the moment. So that was the day that I realized something was really wrong. And I didn't immediately know it was burnout. All I knew was that I just couldn't get myself to do the things that I thought I was supposed to do. It was really scary. I didn't really do anything that day. I distracted myself and I think I watched some TV shows. I, I did some other stuff. I went out and just kind of tried to forget about it and ignore it, but it didn't improve. And I had this incredible hollow feeling. I felt like a robot. I didn't feel anything. I wasn't sad. I wasn't angry. It's, it's not like I had negative emotions. I had no emotions. And that was the scariest part, because if you can't feel the negative stuff, you can't feel anything, the positive stuff. And so it's not even joyless. It's just this, I think the best way to describe it was I felt empty. And I felt empty, again, in hindsight, for a long time, but I was very good at distracting myself with work or with what I considered fun or going out or, or drinking or just doing anything else keeping myself busy just so I wouldn't have to feel. And if you do that long enough, you'll succeed in not feeling. But if you don't feel the negative, you don't feel the positive. So that, that, that was the day. And after a couple of conversations and talking to my girlfriend at the time, I realized that it definitely was burnout. The first thing I did was talk to my team. And this was very difficult to do. Um, but I just told them that, look, something is very off. I don't know what it is, but I have to figure it out. So I'm taking two weeks off. And I understand that it's that's a privileged position just to be able to say, look, I'm taking two-week vacation. I felt a lot of shame, like I was just asking for free vacation. I felt I didn't feel like I deserved the time off. And this was a very it was a very difficult thing to get myself to ask for this and open up in front of the team. For months before the burnout episode, I've had definite burnout symptoms. I was constantly tired, doesn't matter how much I slept. I was losing motivation. Uh, my ambition was going down and down and down. You know, originally I had huge ambitions to build empires and then all I wanted to do was be alone in a forest by myself away from civilization. All the kind of, I think, typical symptoms. And people around me even told me that I might be burning out. But it just the word burnout wasn't even in my dictionary. Like I wouldn't admit it to myself that Darius the Great could have any kind of mental health problems. I was always pride in myself on being the happy guy, on being positive and always having goals and looking forward and, and kind of letting everything else pass. And when I thought that I was letting... I thought I was, I was not letting the negative emotions touch me, but in reality, I was ignoring them from my consciousness, but these things store in your body and in your psyche. They don't go away. If you don't feel and process and let go, and it has to be in that order, you have to feel it, you have to process it, go through it, and let go. You can't go to step three. But I wasn't even doing that. Doing that, I was just ignoring it altogether, thinking that I was, you know, perfectly happy. And when people would ask me how I'm doing, I would automatically always default to good. I'm good. And then if somebody asked how I'm really doing, I had no idea. I did not know. I didn't know how I was doing, how I was feeling. I would, and I, I would think about it for twenty seconds, and I say, "Yeah, I'm good. I'm fine. Nothing is wrong." I was so, so disconnected and detached from the emotions. And I have did a great job of 
overworking for you know more than a decade and 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 thinking to myself that i was the hardcore entrepreneur and i was hustling and i was building my empire and this is what you had to do while i was ignoring the stuff that really mattered so that was the story before and my healing journey began a few weeks after the day i realized i'd burn out where i had this what i already alluded to i call it the epiphany of micros and macros of life i wrote an article about this on medium if you want to check it out called micros and macros of life micros are all tools and hacks and 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 things they can be useful and important but they're all just tools for example you know exercising or eating well or sleeping enough hours and uh, meditation breath work kind of planning your day scheduling all these things are i mean sure they're important and and, and they're they're they'll have their time but they're all tools and i have over optimized my life i was obsessed with the micros and that allowed me to totally ignore the macros and the macros are the stuff that really matters and I think everybody has their own macros, but for me, it was my connection to myself and my emotions that I've ignored, connection to my partner, or if you even have a partner, connection to your family, connection to your friends, connection to nature, connection to that bigger spirit or meaning or God or whatever you believe in or don't believe in, and connection to your mission and purpose. And these are the macros that I have totally ignored. And I've over-optimized for the micros. And so if you looked at my life, it looked like a perfect self help book. I'd wake up at six in the morning after exactly eight hours of extra, eight hours of sleep. I would meditate for 20 minutes. I would do breath work. I would exercise for 30 minutes exactly. I would eat only plant-based food, no caffeine, no alcohol. I would start my day. Every 10 minutes of my day was blocked out. Um, I wouldn't meet with my friends one-on-one. -on -one. I would organize group dinners. That way I can meet multiple people. It sounds stupid, but I thought I was like optimizing my time. And I didn't... I, I allow myself to be so obsessed about every minute there and every detail of this micro that I could ignore the fact that I wasn't feeling anything. I could ignore the fact that I was in the wrong relationship and I was lying to myself and to her. I could ignore the fact that I've been disconnected from my family. I could ignore the fact that I wasn't, I wasn't focusing on my relationships and friendships and I wasn't creating new ones or maintaining the old ones. I could ignore the fact that I was misaligned with the company's vision and mission. I could ignore the fact that I haven't seen nature or, or felt at peace for a very long time and and that's when i realized all these things that's when the healing could begin and i could start making these changes and i wouldn't say i'm healed absolutely maybe i'll never be maybe this is maybe it'll take six months maybe it'll take a year maybe a decade maybe it'll take five lives i don't know uh, we're always peeling layers of an onion. But for me, the way to heal was to address all the macros. So it was to end the relationship. It was to leave the company, even though financially wasn't a good decision because I was incentivized to stay. I could reconnect with my friends. I could re reconnect with my family. I could, and again, I realized it's a luxury, for example, I didn't have children and I, and I had enough finance where I didn't have to work for a while. So I, I, I went to Central America, I went to Guatemala, became a total hippie for, for, for a long time, didn't wear shoes for a month and was just drinking cacao and, and doing psychedelic ceremonies and journeys and, and healing and ecstatic dancing and all kinds of strange hippie stuff in Central America. And then I came back to Europe and, and I didn't, I didn't work for probably half a year that allowed me to 
to reconnect with the purpose and mission and then realize you know what what is it that i want to do and and i'm not saying that i figured everything out it is a continuous journey but i think it's 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 at least i'm moving in the right direction i know that for sure uh the burnout happened a year and a half ago and my life is completely different a lot more fulfilling and i think a lot more productive as well and before we move on to the time nowadays firstly was there any kind of a trigger for the epiphany and the aha moment is there anything you could pinpoint i thought about that a lot but i can't pinpoint a single moment i was it, literally i was i was sitting at home i don't know what i was doing and it kind of like a light bulb went on it, it's yeah just inspiration all of this was clear like all all what were the macros what were the micros it all just came to me in a moment i would call it kind of <laughs> divine intervention if you will and it's rare for me or actually not so much i i i think this is how when i am in tuned with my intuition and i allow space in my time and in my mind then inspiration comes and whether you believe that it's just chemicals in your brain or you believe that you're receiving a message from a higher power or whatever you believe i think it's clear that you have to create space and whether that's physical space actually what i still like to do and one of my practices is to to go away for a couple of times for for a weekend into a cabin in the woods in the middle of nowhere and no internet and no distractions just me and some books and a and journal maybe you need to create a physical space or you need to create you know space with your time to have a few hours to do nothing but reflect and think and that's really hard to do when there is distractions and entertainment 24/7 especially as an entrepreneur where there's always things you could be doing your work never goes to sleep or it's you know it's creating space between you and other people or whatever it is but i i think creating that space is what brings interventions and the insights but it is so difficult and i was avoiding the space so much because when we are not distracting ourselves with instagram an email and work and other obligations or friends whatever when we're not distracting ourselves with with life and we have to just sit and do nothing and feel for example go for a walk in nature with nothing to listen to emotions come up and a lot of times it's negative emotions that we haven't able to process and that's scary as hell I think that's why we're so addicted to our phones and to internet and to everything else because it allows us to not feel. That's what I was using it for sure. And create that's why creating space is so difficult is because <laughs> what if you actually begin to feel some of the things that you've been suppressing for so long? And that's what that's what happens to me. And it, it like I said it is a journey. For example, I one of the tools that has been working well for me is psychedelic therapy. I did a session actually a couple of days ago and I realized that I'm still holding a tremendous amount of sadness and anger in my body. I mean a lifetime accumulation of these emotions because I've always been avoiding sadness and anger because I prided myself on being the happy guy. And and the psychedelic therapy doesn't heal it it just brings it to your awareness makes it very very clear very vivid and i can feel it physically in my body it's like demons under the skin and if you don't process these things and work through them and do the work i think this is how you know physical disease manifests in our bodies there's a fantastic documentary called the work have you seen it i i haven't no okay i i I recommend watching this. I just saw it recently. Once a year 
for a long weekend for four days, there is a large group therapy session for men. It's about 50 guys. Half of the guys are in prison and the other half are volunteers from the outside. What is interesting is that uh, it seems that actually it was the prisoners who were helping more guys from the outside, not the other way around. But it was a group therapy session, so not a lot of hierarchy. But what was interesting for me was I observed is that every single person in there, doesn't matter if they were a prisoner or free or or what age or 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 what what race or whatever, every single one of the guys had one of the two patterns. Either they had accumulated sadness they didn't know how to deal with, or they had accumulated anger they didn't know how to deal with. The exact two things that I felt in my body. And the guys who were in prison, for them, a lot of times the sadness and the anger has accumulated and exploded in an aggressive way. That's why they are in prison. And for the guys and they were free, maybe they were just earlier on their journey. Uh, so I'd really recommend watching this documentary, especially for men, because you'll you'll be able to resonate, and, and it was quite quite fascinating. Thank you. We'll we'll have a look to put also a reference in the in the description. I was thinking before the epiphany, before a moment of realization, or maybe also nowadays in hindsight. Is there anything that you could point to as indicators as things that could have been this kind of a light bulb that you had at the epiphany what was going on in the time before that i know that for me and a lot of my friends it is difficult to feel emotions because for us it's such a abstract topic but one way to look at it and one way that helped me and what was an indicator and definitely for a lot of my male friends was tension and pain in the body we all tend to store stress and anxiety and overwhelm and set and you know sadness and anger and all these emotions in the body if they're not processed and they tend to accumulate in different places for me i store the tension in my stomach and because my stomach is so tense it affects my lower back so i used to experience a lot of lower back pain and i would do everything under the earth i tried yoga and exercise and all kinds of tools and pills it's just everything in the world but i never addressed the real issue of tension in my stomach and once i addressed that then i relieved the pain it could be in a form of headaches or um, a lot of times it's different kind of stomach problems and, and a lot of yeah, tensions in the body. We, we carry a lot of tension in our jaw and our, in our skull. The muscles in our skull get very tense. And so I think a really good indicator to pay attention to is tension in the body. Of course, if you don't live a healthy lifestyle in general, then it's difficult to separate of what is just, you know, lack of exercise and a sedentary lifestyle versus actually storing emotions. There might be other stuff that, you know, they're not related to your emotions. But I would say for me, that was the biggest indicator. And, and that's also how I work with the emotions today is trying to feel in my body physically where it is. And then I know that I feel anger in a specific place. And then I feel sadness in a different place. And it feels a bit differently. But it is, it's a physical feeling inside the body that I can point to. That was one. The other indicator for me was energy. But again, I think that's really hard unless you have, you know, unless you spend a lot of time in the sun and you do exposure to the sun and you eat really well and you exercise and do all the right things. I think it's hard to differentiate if your energy is low because you may be burning out or because you're just not living a very good lifestyle. But for me, I think one of the biggest indicators was my ambition. I've always been a very driven, ambitious guy. And in maybe the year proceeding to me realizing a burnout, my ambition has been diminishing. 
And I thought that maybe I'm just maturing and I'm more realistic or that I'm, you know, it's, it's kind of, I'm going through a life phase and, and I was in my early thirties and I was, I, I thought that maybe, you know, you kind of change through your life. And even though I was ambitious since I was a teenager, maybe that's just not part of my uh, setup anymore. But that was definitely, you know, prior to the burnout, I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to build any companies. I didn't want to have any artistic, creative expression. I didn't want to, I, I just wanted to distract myself and sit at home and watch TV. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, I think those three things are feeling the, feeling the physical pain, um, the energy, and and the ambition levels. Got it. Thank you. Moving forward, who are you nowadays? What changes <laughs> did you integrate? I can tell you that I'm a lot more humble and respectful of of the mind and psychology and the spirit and mental health. I think today I focus on the macros and and all the important stuff. You know, I, I think I'm in a fantastic relationship um, that is feels so right to me and it will we'll see where the future is, but it just feels really right. I spend a lot of time in nature. I, I, I dedicate time with my friends. I spend a lot of time with my family, um, and not just during Christmas, but in the last two months, I've spent more time with my family than the last 10 years. So I'd say addressing all the mac mac macros that I was talking about, specifically these days, in the last couple of weeks, I am really working on being able to feel sadness and anger, letting it go through my body and then letting it go. That's what I'm actively working on. And I have a therapy session tonight, for example, to address that specific thing. I went boxing this morning specifically to let out the anger out through exercise and through kind of a productive way. And, and that's that's one thing that I'm spending the most time and, and getting a lot of advice. Uh, when I realized that I have all these stored emotions, I reached out to most of, to, I reached out to a couple of my male friends that I trust. I asked them how they deal with it. I get all the different insights and perspectives from them and I try to apply it. So like I said, it definitely not, it's a journey that doesn't end, I don't think. It's always you're peeling layers of an onion until until we're not here one day. Mm. Beautiful. In terms of actionable or small steps, based on your experience, is there anything you could or would like to share with the audience as as an advice, as as something that you deem helpful? <sighs> I know that anyone could have spoken to me before I realized I'd burn out, tell me I had burned out and I wouldn't listen to them. I was so disassociated with the possibility that I might have any kind of mental health. And it might be because of the stigma around it, it might be because I personally have prided myself on being the happy guy. It might be because as a kid, I wasn't allowed to express my emotions fully. It might be whatever reason, but I wouldn't have listened to anyone. And so I think it's really hard to give advice. I would say the best place to start is to get, this is going to sound cliche, but um, get therapy before 
you think you're depressed or you're burnt out totally. It doesn't have to be therapy. It could be coaching maybe if you, again, a lot of stigma around therapy and getting that kind of help. It could be coaching. It could be maybe talking to a friend. But I think the most important thing is to open up to the possibility and just be, be curious and be willing to explore and not judge all these emotions as as bad. They're here for a reason. They're gifts and they all have things to teach us. If you already know that you're struggling, if you already feel like something is off, again, professional help, even though it sounds like a cliche and I know most people will not do it, but if even one person that hears this will, please do it. There's lots of different tools. There's lots of apps. You can do it anonymously. You can do all kinds, but actually talking to someone about it openly and be willing to listen, I think this is the most important thing. Thank you, Darius. Are there, as there is nothing really more to add on my end, are there any closing thoughts, remarks, anything on your heart? I think I will just end with saying that I think just reiterate the last point. It's these emotions that come to us are not all bad, even though they're perceived as negative emotions. They all they have things to teach us and they're gifts, which is hard to see in the moment. But that is, I think, the biggest lesson I'm learning right now. Because if you ignore the emotions, they don't go away. They just get delayed and get bigger. I think that's the most important lesson. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. And with this, we're closing today's talk. Really nothing more to add on my end aside. Just please watch after yourself. Listen to yourself. Accept accept the feelings. Accept your struggles. They are there for a reason. The sooner you take action, the sooner you actually realize they are there, the better chances you may find out what is their purpose and what's the reason, what's the trigger, and also how to handle gracefully. So thank you, Darius, for being so open. It was amazing. Uh, it was an amazing opportunity to um, hear your story and to empathize, to feel what you've been through. Surely it will be helpful for many more people. So thank you for taking the time and also being so open. Yeah, thank you for giving me an opportunity to to talk about it. You know, sharing this and being vulnerable is a form of therapy and healing. So it also helps me actually. If people find this interesting, check out Vitality Therapeutics on Instagram or any platform. We'll be sharing more about the progress. And um, if you want to hear more from me, you can find Darius Mora on YouTube. I share a lot of uh, lessons about business, but I'm also sharing more and more about mental health and psychology and performance and and that side of the world. So uh, if if people resonate, they can get more there. Lovely. We'll make sure to put the links into the descriptions, uh, into the description. And with this, thank you, everyone. Hope you keep safe. Hope you keep sane. Take care of yourself and uh, see you in the next one. Bye. Ciao.